From the magnificent Midwest, it's The Suzanne Venker Show, where men and women are equal in value but wildly different by nature. Join us here every week as we challenge the culture's hugely flawed narratives about men, women, sex, and love. From coast to coast and from around the world, thank you for joining us. So some of you might have heard, I hope, the first episode of my new Love and Money series, which I did just two weeks ago. And I'm now back with another one. And this time I've brought Bill with me, who has agreed to be part of this series as much as possible anyway, as well as the parenting series. I just feel like these conversations will be so much more substantive with him, especially since my plan is to link the subject of money to marriage or relationships in general. And I think it will be very helpful for people to hear how Bill and I think about and handle our own finances so that the episodes become super relatable, which is ultimately what I want to do. So he's with me here today. Welcome back, Bill. Thank you. It's a thrill to be here. Hopefully we can help uh, help you guys figure some things out about life and money and, uh, and marriage, and uh, we'll have some fun for the next hour. Okay, so... Wow, this is such a big subject. <laughs> it is indeed. It's such a big subject. It okay, is we're really we're super excited. We, I mean, we've never done this, and um, it's just the beginning. If if we do it the way we want to do it, and um, yeah, I'm just super excited. Uh, the so subject I, is fraught with yeah. so many tensions, and it, it just has so much weight in our lives every day. Money, 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 and then you mix in a little love, and and uh, uh, that can make it even more uh, intense. So it, it's a very uh, serious subject that I don't think people really talk about with their kids from the very beginning, but we'll get into all that anyway. So I think the best place to start is to acknowledge that it can take years to really understand our own relationship with money. And I really don't feel like there's any way to resolve money differences in marriage without understanding the generational money, the generational money patterns or lessons that were passed on to us, respectively, that tend to stay with us regardless of the amount of money we have in the bank. And I think that's a really key thing. I want to say that again: the money patterns or lessons that were passed on to us that are inside of us. It's the psychology of money, if you will, that stay with us regardless of how much money we have in the bank. And I'm, we're going to come back to that. Um, and that's because the psychology doesn't really change unless you change your mindset about it. That It's not the dollar amount. It can be the dollar amount. It's not like that can never be a thing. But anyway, okay, we're going to come back to that. So I want to start by asking you, Bill, and then I'll, I'll chime in on my own story after yours. What do you remember about money growing up as a child? What money messages did you, what's your takeaway? Uh, What's so your story? Let me say that it's kind of complicated. So uh, when I was very young, um, my parents were were married, and I guess up to about the age of seven, um, things were pretty normal. And then about the age of seven, I noticed my dad wasn't around as often. And then by the time I was nine, he moved out. And by the time I was eleven, they were divorced. So my father was a, a uh, professional. He was a white collar worker. He had a uh, degree in um, accounting. And then my mother was also educated. She had a degree in education. So uh, I'm the youngest of six. And there's a seven year gap between myself and my next oldest brother. I was not an oops. They kept trying. I just appeared. So Basically, when my parents got divorced, uh, my mom was a stay-at-home mom. Um, she did teach grade school for a couple of years when I was in grade school and then um, ended up getting away from that job and going to another job. Her pay was very minimal, was barely much of anything. So we went from kind of a middle class, upper middle class uh, lifestyle to, I would say, lower middle class or po almost poverty level. Um, and I will sum it up in this way. My life as a child was about 15 watt light bulbs. So this was how frugal my mom was. Um, bless her heart. She 
tried to create as stable of a, an economic environment for me as possible. And she skimped and did everything she could to save pennies and dimes and nickels and lived a very um, humble life to allow me to, to get me through college and high school and all these other things. Um, so my message was pretty much, uh, you're on the moment of disaster at any moment um, financially. And so therefore you need to really not spend a lot of money on frivolous things. I'll just put it that way. Wouldn't you say that's about well, I wasn't there. I'll take no, but that kind of summarizes. <laughs> oh, say, I mean, you know I me well today. enough. We've yeah. been married twenty five yeah. oh, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into that. We're gonna get into that. So let's. Well, I want to stay focused still on your story, though. So because okay. I know there's more to it than that. I think that's yeah, definitely that's definitely. A I don't want to bore everyone with the. Details. No, no, no. They're, you're not boring them. They they want to hear this. Um, I put a little note in here so you didn't forget this part because I think I don't know if you've. I know we've talked about this, but I don't know if you've thought about it with respect to the the um the narratives that you're still living with that we all still live with in our head um about our upbringings and the things that we took away from things we saw so in addition to what you just said also tell people how you spent your weekends so hey, wait hold on, hold on. Uh, well okay well, this uh, was uh, early on so when my parents got divorced in 1975 you know, in those days, divorce was uh, was not a good thing, and it was like you had some kind of a, uh, a on your vaccine chest. or a, huh? Uh, the A from that, uh, you know, the A on your chest. Yeah, from from, adultery from, from yeah, yeah, right. Or yeah, yeah. or uh, or you you had some kind of a communicable disease. Yeah, yeah. So um, it wasn't looked upon the way it's looked upon. Like, eh, you know, you got divorced. Oh, you've been married six times. Eh, whatever. It wasn't like that. Um, and in those days, women did not get huge alimonies either. So the lawyers were kind of leaning the other way. Now it's swung the exact opposite way. Um, uh, so anyway, um, my father, um, uh, remarried right away, re, well, not right, right away right. within the, they got divorced in, in May of 75 and he remarried in October of 75. <laughs> And so <laughs> that's, yeah, that's, that's so you like to me, that is right away. <laughs> All right. Whatever. That, anyway, I mean, anyway, okay. well, it's like, you made it sound like the very next day well, or that same day oh, they got divorced. No, 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 no. So, uh, uh, so I would have, I had visiting, you know, every two weeks I would go visit him and there was a period there where, who, who did he marry? Where like, the, like, it was like, a, it was a woman who was like a secretary at his office and, um, she at the time was divorced and she lived in a trailer park in Arlington, Missouri, which no longer exists. It's not there anymore. And so I would go visit them in the trailer <laughs> and it was, don't laugh. Susanna. No. So, I'm, so, um, and she was going through her own issues. She had gotten divorced and, and, you know, was a single mother and had two children at home still. They were like high school and a little older. Um, and I just got an education from seeing the trailer park, like this is a trailer park and this is where trailer park people live. And so, uh, thankfully I didn't have to experience that in, in with my life with my mother. Um, there were some fortunate economic things that played out there that I won't go into detail about, but, um, we were able to end up getting in a house, which needed a lot of work to be fixed, which my brothers and I did diligently for many years to make it so that it was livable. Um, so thank God we have the, the wherewithal and the mental capacity to use tools and, and things to, to make the place a, a, a home. Um, so my experience was I had, I was able to kind of gleam a lot from that, you know, where I was living with my mom in a house. And then my dad was living with his second wife in a trailer. This was not forever. It was, he, he you got to keep in mind, he was, he was an accountant. So he saved money. And he eventually, they once they got married, they moved into a house um, in, in, in you know a neighborhood that was like thirty minutes away from me, and I would go visit him at the house. But it was an education for me in the sense that I was seeing all these different economic uh, backgrounds that people came from, and really what I gathered from it in the end uh, through that and met some of my friends and all these other things is that money, um, money, doesn't necessarily bring you happiness is what, what I was learning while everything else in society was saying that money brought you happiness. That's not what I was learning at all. I was learning that money was in some cases, either you, if you had a lot, there could be a lot of sadness. And if you didn't have a lot, there could be a lot of sadness. 
So there's two ends of the spectrum. And really what you want to do is be in the middle of that to where you have plenty and you're in control of it and you're having a good life and you're using it as a tool to enhance some of your experiences. Just put it that way. I think it's, I don't think I know anybody else who went from upper middle class for the first third of his life mm-hmm. to lower middle class mm-hmm. and then also had a window into a compl- a world that those of us in our economics would, ne- I've never, I've, of course I've seen yeah. trailer parks, but I've never gone in one right. and like experienced that. So right. I feel like this has so much to do with you're being a chameleon. Right. That's what I always would take away. But my question for you is, what do you think you've brought with you? You kind of um, referenced it a little bit before um, from your past to your current relationship with money. And how has it changed? Extreme conservatism is what I would say. That would be the description I would use. Um, uh, Basically, uh, I have a hard time spending money on myself, uh, mainly because my whole focus is Suzanne and the kids. Um, that's slightly changing now that we have, uh, you know, we've got one that's gone off in the world and uh, our son is a year and a half away from graduating college. Um, I want to add one more thing to this. So to kind of put this in perspective, uh, when I was talking about divorce and that it's kind of a, uh, in 1975, it was kind of like having a, a you know, disease. A, a disease, yeah. like you had BD or something and nobody wanted to talk to you or you had, you know, herpes on your mouth or whatever. So um, my mom, uh, I'm Catholic. And so I went to Catholic grade school, which in those days wasn't very expensive, really, when you think about it, it was pretty cheap. People could afford it. And um, my mom taught at the grade school that I went to. And when the divorce happened, they let her go. They didn't sign her to another contract. And I think that's because some of the parents didn't like the fact that my mom was teaching there. And also, I think they caught her crying one day in class because I remember having a classmate in third grade come up to me and says, why is your mom crying? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know why she's crying because she taught me um, handwriting. Um, So uh, my point here is that she ended up having to get a job for the St. Louis Special School District was the only place she could get employed. And her salary was six thousand dollars a year. And that was probably 1978. And she would come home uh, when the full moon was out with bruises all over her body because the kids would act up. And so she went through a lot of sacrifice with that. And it was very hard for her. And we were skimping all the time, which is goes back to my, she was doing everything she could to save money, which goes back to the 15 watt light bulbs all over the house. It was like we lived in a mortuary. It was so dark in the house at night. We didn't have cable. Every, a lot of my friends had cable TV. We didn't have that. Um, you know, there were a lot of things that we didn't do or have. When I had Converse high tops for playing basketball, that was a big deal. You know, those shoes probably cost 50 bucks. And my brothers teased me about it. And that was the one thing I had was those damn shoes. And they meant the world to me. And And so that's how simple our life was. Um, and we might throw in that it was just the two of you at this point because yeah. you're older. See, they, they might were wonder because you said that you had six, five siblings. Yeah. So they're all gone. And they so had this, all started this, to move out. They didn't experience what you experienced. No. Uh, yeah. No, so which they always, it, sometimes they ask me about it, but um, uh, they were all in college or they had, had moved on. Um, my brother Bob was around more, more so because everybody else was, was done. He was going back and forth between school and um, he's my closest brother. So in so, age. So, in, so, so you're, you're learning a lot just by, you know, I, I've talked a lot about this, um, Rachel Cruz book that I encourage people to, to, um, get, uh, know yourself, know your money. And it has you going back to determining which quadrant that you grew up in family wise and what your messaging was. So some of those messages are, um, nonverbal, everything you've described so far Mm -hmm. has been nonverbal things that you determined on your own Mm -hmm. from observing. So that's one way we all get our messages. And then the other way for some people is verbal. You either, and you've got the quadrant, I believe that was uh, emotionally closed, but I can't remember exactly, but it meant that you knew that there was stress around money, but there was no discussion. Well, I shouldn't say that because your mom, let me back up for a minute because I'm going in, in the wrong direction. What I want to ask you is you're learning about money on your own from watching, but the follow-up is the follow-up question is what was 
their verbal messages specifically to you, each of your mom and your dad, about money? I w- well, if really, any. there wasn't really much. So, for instance, um, unfortunately, my dad died when I was 23. So there's a lot of things that I missed out on. I mean, honestly, the longest time I spent with him as an adult was uh, about two months in Arizona when I worked. Um, I lived with him and my stepmother. Uh, for a couple of months was in the summer working at the Phoenician resort as an unskilled laborer. And that was about as close as I could say that I got to him as an adult, seeing him every day. And I learned a heck of a lot about him and about my mom and about their relationship. He, um, he did not trust the stock market. Uh, he, you know, he, here he is a depression. He was like most, up people, depression. most people are that way. Right. In that, yeah, in that then, era yeah. of our parents. Mm-hmm. And my mom, my mom was the same way. Her father was a doctor, uh, a physician, a very well-respected physician in St. Louis. And so she, she came from a very, uh, how do I say, upper middle class background. My dad's family owned a stamp company that's still in the family's name, a rubber stamp company that's still in the family to this day. But my father's generation, there were so many of them with all the uncles that they, they, was, they just had to do something else. So that's why he went into accounting. Anyway, he, so his message was, I had, he had investments in, in insurance. So after the depression, a lot of people bought uh, insurance policies. And that was how they saved money because they didn't trust the stock market. That was his message. Um, but he did tell me that his, one of his brother's, Um, did play in the stock market and kept telling my dad to play in the stock market. And my dad did have regrets later before he died that he did not play in the stock market, um, largely because he just didn't understand it. Uh, Whereas with my mom, uh, her story is, is incredibly interesting because I'll put it this way. When she passed, all six of us inherited money that we did not expect. And it was a number that kind of blew all of us away. So she was so amazing. Sorry, I'm getting a little emotional. She saved money because she said largely she was going to not allow any of us to have to take care of her. That was her goal. She was like, I'm not going to make myself a burden on my children. And so she did a great job listening to some people that she knew. One of her bosses kind of helped coach her and she saved uh, an incredible amount of money when she passed away, which is, it just blows me away to think about how she did that over the last uh, 30 years of her life, Um, which tells me that you can do it. Anyone can do it. Uh, So her, her message really was, um, she just lived incredibly simply and she didn't, again, she didn't have cable. Um, Did her um, politics and view of the world affect your, your um, view at the time on money being, something I would say for rich Republicans. Well, you know, what was, it wasn't just her. It wasn't just her. It was also my Jesuit background. I went to Jesuit high school. And so their whole thing is, you know, capitalism is evil and horrible and bad. And um, how many years did you absorb that where you absorbed it? Like you kind of were on board with it. Like what would your, before you answer that, hold on. I know this because you're so different today. He's pausing because he's just, he's such a different person today. You have to go so way back to that. But what would your college friends say about you at that time? Um, Bob, for example. Well, no, my well, not even my college, my grade school friends. We're talking about people that know me my whole life. So I think it's really strange. I don't know how to explain it. I think that the core of me is very balanced and very centered, but leaning to the right in life. And um, I believe very much in the fact that you can change your circumstances in life. And I, I think I'm a, I'm a living example well, you of that. Absolutely are. That's a whole nother uh, episode right there. So it's the whole point is that, you know, you, you get dealt cards in life and you got to play them. And, and that's part of the lesson of it. That's part of the existence. That's part of why we're here. So, so you can't let things get in your way because you will have things get in your way all the time. And if you just say, 
well, this happened to me or that happened to me. You're blaming the situations. There's going to be storms. The weather comes. The weather is, is basically a metaphor for all the things that happen to you. So either you're just going to walk through it and get over it, or you're just going to roll over and say, I'm done. I can't do anything. So my, my whole philosophy was I'm going to fix this. I'm going to not let this happen to me. So I've always been a very curious person and one who craves knowledge. And I think that's kind of what started to happen to me. I also think the base of me, like I said, is, is a certain way. My father was very much right-leaning. My mother was right-leaning, but we won't get into all that. But something changed in her when Reagan uh, won the election, and he did some things after he won the election based on some things he was going to do. And so that started to twist her a little bit. I also think that she um, uh, she felt like things had happened to her in life. And so I just don't take the stance of, of being a victim in the things that happen. They just happen. Um, so it was, Henry asked me the other day when I told him we were going to do this and, and he was asking some questions. Who's Henry? <laughs> um, <laughs> our son, I hopefully everybody knows his name by now. Sorry. Our son, Henry. Um, Cause I was sharing how we're going to be doing this episode and how differently we were raised. And I'm going to talk about how different. I was raised in a moment. And he said, how does dad, how did, how did dad know to do what he's done? Uh, and we're talking financially here because uh, Bill has, um, Bill is very, very opposite of his dad with the stock market and uh, very good at that and has built up um, a very hefty 401k. And he wanted to know how you knew how to do that. And I answered because he's a reader and you teach yourself just kind of like what mm -hmm. you just said so that if your parents didn't teach you that doesn't mean you're doomed no. it just means it's a harder either a harder road or you might learn later so i think in your correct me if i'm wrong in your story you had to teach you've always said this not just with money you had to teach yourself everything mm -hmm. literally everything because yeah. you were you basically raised yourself so it's it is really quite remarkable where you started in your 20s and where you are today um professionally and financially and i and that's, like I said, that's a whole separate episode, but I just want to tell you that Henry asked me that. And I said, he reads the wall street journal faithfully and you teach yourself Yeah, and he has common sense Well, and, it, and wait a minute, there's a little more to that. Cause I'm going to talk about my story and that certainly plays into it. Let's face it, which gets into like who you marry and becoming a team and things you didn't get growing up that I got and vice versa and how you bring those together to hopefully create. Well, there's more stronger. truth than that. And I think really, cause I, for my, for myself, I started to realize that the business world really wasn't this evil, horrible thing that took advantage of people that the reality was that it was a ironically the fact that the the jesuits are very much about poverty without capitalism they would not have people to donate money to them to keep them going so that's the ironic part of that which is why you've heard if you pay attention to the pope he said stuff about how capitalism can be evil and greed and filled with greed but then he also realized that it's a necessary thing he said something about that capitalism is a good thing because it helps people rise up in their lives and and gain uh self um determination so what do you think was different about your story that made it so that you once fell for the capitalism is evil theory where your classmates may not have what what is your story that you know what I mean? Because you had friends who never fell for that at all. What's different about you? Uh, what happened I, in your childhood that made you feel that way? It's not even that. I think it's more just having a um, kind of a um, uh, a uh, what do I want to uh, angst or or frustration or anger about people that have money, and not and I think that's where did that what's come happened from? is it's prevalent in our society right. now where you have this going on. But it came from the fact that I didn't have it. So it's kind oh, of like okay. it, when you don't have it, yeah. you think everybody else who has it, like, why do they have it? I should have it. They should be given it to me. Why are they tasking us so much? They should give me their money. If that's that's the mentality well, that goes some people, on. Some people have a different take. Well, they'll just say, I don't have it and I want that. And I'm going to go get it. They're not mad that, about it. That's true. But I think the people who are incapable of pushing themselves to change their lives look at it as if I can't get that. Like it's a, it's your, you're the server in the country. Yeah, but club. you said that you once shared that when you were young, that you thought capitalism was evil, that you can't get ahead. Isn't that what you said or no? Yeah. So why did you feel that way as opposed I, to? Because I didn't have it. I just explained to you. I didn't have the money. I know, but not everybody who doesn't have money I takes, think, has that takeaway I mentally. I think a lot of people so, do. I really do think well, a lot yeah, of people Well, yeah, no, a lot of people do, but it. some people use it to propel them and say, I'm going to go get some. And then they become, you know, like 
voraciously ambitious from the age of 18. That's, and I'm saying, why was your, why were you in one camp? That's all I'm asking. Like, what was the, did you hear money was evil? No, growing I didn't up? hear money was evil. No. Why do you, so no, that's I, just, what I heard was, was that companies ravage and destroy the planet. That's what I kept hearing. Oh, well, that's what I'm trying to get it. So th this is all about, this is what this is, is what that messaging was in your home. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to get. And I feel it's like it's not you're just in my home. It's not in my it. home. It was, it was all over the place, Suzanne. It was in, in the Jesuit education. It's very, at that time, it was very much about uh, the planet. We we're destroying the planet, doing these things. And that was kind of the mindset too. Okay. You remember the 1970s commercial with the American Indian that was, which he was an American Indian, but he's crying because people are throwing trash on the ground. No. And okay. yeah, that was, that well, was anyway. a thing then. All right. So, so, okay. They even said that we'd so, run out of oil by the year 1986. Yeah. yeah. Did that happen? I don't... Okay. And then so they were going to go into another ice age. That didn't happen either. So this might be a good place to segue into um, how different my upbringing was. So let's maybe... I'll, I'll try to make it a little bit faster, but let's let's do that really quickly just to show the, the difference. So needless to say, um, you know, my story is just very different. And so... I didn't have any of those. I just didn't have, I mean, there's just nothing about my background that matches anything you said. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do this is because we know that most people, I don't know about most, but a lot of people are in this same boat. Um, they come from very different backgrounds and they're trying to build a life and a marriage from two totally different worldviews. Maybe there are similarities in some, but the, the differences are so vast that, However, we were taught, for lack of a better way of putting it, is still we find often with us years later. And it, that's the psychology of money that I'm that I'm talking about. And it has to do with how you spend and how you go through life and how can you get married and not know. How, there's just there's no way to have a good marriage if you don't have a good money situation. And by that, I don't mean what you have in the bank. I mean, are you on the same page and going to the same place. That's, that's basically it. We're going to get into that. Okay. So I grew up in an upper class, um, up middle upper class, sorry, wealthy suburb of St. Louis, which ironically was about three minutes from where you were. Um, probably drove by your house every single day going to, to, to high school. To, yeah. Cause he went to, we both went to private schools. So like, that's an interesting thing right there. So we're all, we're both private school educated despite a very different um, uh, economic situation. Mm -hmm. um, my mother grew up, my mother was a product of the Great Depression. I mean, both my parents were, but my my father's family was not hit in the same way that my mom's was. And I think I've mentioned this, mentioned this in the past, but her father lost his job in the Depression and her mother had to go to work and fortunately had a college degree. And so that we you know was able to make that work, but they never had a home, never had a car. They used the streetcar. They lived in an apartment with three generations. Um, and her mother went to work and her grandmother was there. And the, the experience of, 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 of her father losing her job and going into this other space, uh, financially, kind of like yours, actually, mm -hmm. because a little bit about what you were talking about. Yep. Um, that's why Dee Dee and I are yeah, alike. Yeah, in some I know ways. you are. You, I know you totally are. Um, it, it never left her. Yeah. And it, it dramatically affected her. Well, her, the way she moved through, you know, her marriage from a financial perspective. Um, she was what they call an underspender where she literally could not spend money. Um, and, and and never stopped. I mean, that just she, all the way up to her death. She was never any different. And that was probably the biggest fights that I recall is her unreasonable, her unreasonable um, frugality. Yeah. Her alligator arms. She couldn't yeah, reach her pockets. There you go. Alligator <laughs> arms. Um, and my dad just, just, oh my God, just the exasperation on his face. I can see it clear as day and just giving up because there's just, it was bad. It was bad. But now, despite that, that's like one piece of the puzzle is, is that, but then also the lessons that I learned from really both of them, um, when it comes to money were absolutely, if you put that other thing aside, 
fantastic. And I realized more and more what a leg up I had in the messaging that I got, which was very Dave Ramsey. Like you guys have heard me talk about him old school, how you build wealth, live on less than you make use cash, invest wisely, which meant buy and hold as opposed to trying to jump on the next hot thing. I had a family member who liked to do that. And she used to talk about, they both used to say, Oh, you know, so-and-so is trying to get me to buy this, but they don't do that. You know, you buy it once you hold on to it for 50 years kind of thing. Very, very old school investing rock solid. Um, completely um, disinterested in comparing um, what they had to their neighbors. Mm-hmm. Um, completely disinterested. The mm-hmm. whole keeping up with the Jones things is just comical. It, mm-hmm. just, it just didn't happen. Um, uh, uh, you cook at home. You don't eat out when you have food at home. That makes no sense because eating out is expensive and fattening. Right. So, <laughs> and these are all the same messages I yeah, got yeah, that, really from my yeah, mom yeah. unconsciously. Except I mean, that what's so what's so different about it is that the difference is she had she didn't she, she had to you couldn't yeah, if you wanted right, to right. I mean, and going to get a, a whopper on Sunday once a month for everybody was a big deal. That was our going out. Right. And but, then the, uh, I want to say this about the cash thing, because you made me, I'm uh, sorry, I'm interrupting uh, your story, but uh, my mom paid if she, she would have cash and she would pay for things in cash or she'd write a check, but she did not have a credit card. She said, I can't get a credit card because no one will give me one because I don't have the money and I'm, and I'm a f- female, not a man. But my grandmother used to carry around a white envelope, just like you did, Susie, with cash in it to ba- pay for everything. That was my mom. Yeah, and I think mom. we talked a lot about this when we were dating because it was really interesting that we the mess some of those messages just those very conservative messages about money in general putting aside the story of our lives in the other way um, were very similar. Um, but again, the difference is we could have afforded to do way more sure. than my mother chose sure. or would allow to do, much right. to my father's dismay. Right. Your story is different because there was no option. Yeah. So it's not the same. It is the same and it's not the same. Well, it isn't because she still it, saved money. She lived well, well below her means and saved a crap ton of money. But yeah. Yeah, but I mean like the, ex- I'm talking about not what she did in the end of the life for you, but the experience of mm-hmm. living mm-hmm. and what that's creating for you in your messaging sure. about stuff is going to be different because you just knew, like for instance, I use that as com- comparing to people when they know their mother, both their parents have to work because there's not enough money to put food on the table. They feel that and know that. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're a big wig and you're just choosing mm-hmm. to work full time and leave, not mm-hmm. be at home, they know that too. They, right. that they're going to experience that same right. structure right. very differently. Yeah. It's kind of like that. Like I, I can't explain to you the, well, the, what went on and the fighting and the feeling <laughs> of there's just so much to sure, that, but that, sure. but that's why I'm doing this is I'm trying to talk about what are those things that we all took away that we experienced day in and day out sure. for 18 years. Yeah. It's, it's, it's mind blowing when you think about you're just a kid and you're not in control of the money and you're watching it and you're just observing it and taking it all in. You have no choice but to sit and observe it. No. So you're thinking, this is what I do want. This is what I don't want. This is what I'm never going to do. This is what you're, you're creating this life for yourself yeah. before you're even putting it all together. Right. Right. And that's, that's what I want. That's why I'm doing this episode. It's what, who is that person that we all became with respect to money what were our takeaways and what kind of life did we, and what are our belief system with our philosophy? Let's put it that way. Um, so yeah. So anyway, and then as, as time went on, uh, you know, I don't know how to explain it. I mean, we, I, 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 I ran in circles with people who had a lot of money and, uh, we were sort of the low end of that circle. <laughs> um, and, I always tease, tease uh, Suzanne uh, that uh, she grew up in the trailer park uh, of Clayton, uh, uh, but it really, or Ledoux. or Ledoux. And the funny thing is Ledoux, when you think of St. Louis, Ledoux is like one of the richest places in the whole country with these giant houses and big acreage and all this. And she just lived on a regular lane right there on the border of Clayton. Yeah. So, uh, which today, which wasn't regular, but because as life was getting bigger, the, people thought of this particular lane as a stepping stone to the, to the real thing. Right. And that, to my mother and father and where they came from, that was the cream of the pop. 
cream of the crop. You don't, you don't continue. Like I said about the comparing, there was no comparing and needing to just never be satisfied like that. So if you ask me, what's my takeaway? Um, my, my own personal takeaway is living in moderation, being grateful for what you have, and most importantly, being content with what you have Mm -hmm. and not always looking for more. Neither one of my parents had that in them so that when they created their life financially, once they, you know, were in a good spot, it's like, that's it. It's done. Now you just now you just live conservatively for the rest of your life mm-hmm. kind of thing. You don't mm-hmm. keep looking. So there was just incredible contentment and and gratitude. And I don't think I realized um, ab- about this mindset um, until um, I until my mom would openly talk. Well, this is what we didn't talk about. My dad was a CPA and my mother was yep. a stockbroker. So yep. this is probably the biggest difference between Bill and me in terms of what we got growing up. So I had this leg up in terms of having financially savvy parents. And I got completely different messaging than Bill did about the stock market and about um, how to build wealth. And so I remember watching my mom read The Millionaire Next Door. I think I was in college and I was noticing it. And um, that's about, you know, it's the same messages of like, um, it's like the Sam Walton way of life where you you build wealth, but you, you're wearing the same clothes, you're driving your pickup truck. You're just a you're regular person. You're not driving person. around like a millionaire. You're no, driving around no. like you barely have a pot to piss in. Now, here's a great story. I remember my dad wanting to buy a Cadillac and my mother would say, we're not buying a Cadillac. We're not going to be flashy like that. There's no way. So that was a big fight. He never did get a Cadillac. It's like driving Miss Daisy. (laughs) Oh my God. Um, Yeah, so. Well, think about this way. I want to add more to this. So my dad grew up in, in the South City just like Suzanne's dad did. And South City and St. Louis are, they're kind of like row houses. They're 1,700 square feet. And you can have anywhere from a family of four to a family of nine. And my dad lived in a family of nine in this little tiny house where every there's two, there's three bedrooms. And one bedroom was all the boys slept in. And the other bedroom was where all the girls slept. And I get, I just am blown away by how they crammed all those people in that house. To where Suzanne's and then Suzanne's mom live in the apartment, and then when they moved to the to the neighborhood in in uh, Ladue, that house to both of them was a mansion. It was like a plantation, and mm-hmm. it's really just a two story house. It's twenty nine hundred square feet. And your mom was like, "I'm never. I want to. I'm dying here." I yeah. remember her saying yeah. that. I'm going to die here. And they bought it in nineteen sixty five. Is that right, Suzanne? Uh, something like that. And yeah. then we moved her out and in 2010 but i'm just using that as a comparison that that yeah like you get a house and that's it you, and li- you, live and you there. die there right, right i mean that's what you do okay which so that's <laughs> so now so we get into what we did differently so we're gonna talk about our marriage because i think that's where we didn't mean to spend so much time on our respective upbringings but um basically we wanted to just set that stage to then acknowledge how that plays into our own marriage yeah. and our own ability to manage money together right and build um a future that is strong both relationally and financially with these different backgrounds and i know all of you are in the same boat everybody is literally everybody is right so so that's where i wanted i wanted to get to that a little bit about our own marriage and how it's been a bit of a struggle um in part because like with other everybody else, you're coming at it with two different things. Mm-hmm. So you you are um, you it's have like tectonic plates, as I said before. We're, we're two tectonic plates rubbing up against each other about all the financial stuff, and I think mm-hmm. it's been quite a lesson for both of us because um, uh, instead of uh, creating an earthquake, we're actually creating a mountain. So um, a wonderful mountain where it's just it's. It's wonderful. It's very large but, and and very tall, and is not going anywhere. <laughs> That's good. That's very good. And and the key for that, and the reason why we've been able to do that, isn't is is to us the number one reason why is what we're. That's a long way of getting here. Is um because we're a team. Communication. Well, hold on, hold on. That's yeah, I know, point. I know, I know. But yeah. hold on, I want to really emphasize this first because <clears throat> this yeah, yeah. before you get to the communication, this is a huge. It's everything. Mm -hmm. It's a mindset and Mm -hmm. you either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. If you don't have it, all the communication in the world isn't going to do anything. You've got to first have this mindset. And so I want to, I want to hone in on that because that is what I'm seeing people 
in the modern generation struggling with so much is that they have really just the wrong mindset altogether about when it comes to money and marriage. They are moving through the world with a very big his and her mentality. And you're, you've got your stuff over here. I've got my stuff over here. And we're going to basically live like roommates and just manage money as though we're not married. Because to me, marriage is you are one. And what's yours and mine uh-huh. is mine. And what's mine is yours. Uh-huh. And all the money, no matter what its source, comes into the home is in one pot. And by one pot, I don't mean one account. So don't everybody freak out on me. I just mean it's in one pot where it's half his, half hers, regardless of the source of that income. So no, I did not earn an income for a long time when the kids were little. That's irrelevant. Half of Bill's salary was mine. And that is how marriage has always been viewed because it is a much greater, or at least always has been until recently, spiritual concept where you are building, like you just said, a family, a team, a building, however mm-hmm. you want to phrase it. Mm-hmm. And each person is, it doesn't matter what they're doing mm-hmm. task wise. It's no. for this one. The greater good. Great. Yeah. 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 And it's, and it's, uh, and also it, it, the thing about money, in my opinion, is just another one of those big rocks that either creates intimacy or breaks it. Yeah. So what I mean by that is, when you communicate the way we communicate, it brings you closer. Well, hold on. The in way terms we of, hold on. The way we talk about money. No, I know, but I don't want people to think we've always communicated well. No, about no, it. no, 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 no. So, no, it's a, it's, but it's something we've learned yeah. in that, in that, <laughs> by really breaking it down and getting into the dirt of it, you actually become closer, and and you share. It forces you to come together on another front. So, you know, I look at Suzanne and she's beautiful and she's smart and she's wise and all those things. But then you have, we've had these children. So we raise the kids together. That's one of the pieces of it. That's one of the, the, um, one of the pieces of the pie of marriage. And then you have the financial part. That's another piece. These are all these little things that are very important to them all being together and and then all of that creates intimacy. And money is one that I think people shy away from because it's so fraught with yeah. all of this Stop. history that you yeah. bring with. It's a big piece of baggage yeah. because, you know, not only that, your parents' marriage is another big piece mm-hmm. of baggage. And then just who you are is another big piece of baggage. But if you can get all the bags open and start hanging the clothes in the closet, <laughs> things do look pretty good. And you get it organized and you're both sharing. You don't have to share clothes, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> You're, you know, you're, That's good. you're talking That's about good. it and you're figuring it out and you're working on it. And it's not, it's and not necessarily an easy thing. It's not an easy thing. It's extremely painful. It's extremely difficult. We've been there, done that. We get it. Um, and, and it can feel easier to just keep things separate. And for a while it will, it will float. It'll float that way until a, a big purchase needs to be made and you have to come together on it and then you're going to, and all the stuff that you haven't been dealing with is going to come out. Um, or B, all these thoughts and feelings related to spending are not being addressed and then that's going to explode later. So it's it's a not a sustainable situation, in my opinion. Now you can float, you know, for decades, I guess, and have separate accounts, but in some cases but you're not going to have the intimacy because you're literally stepping around. I mean, how do you, how do you create a life with somebody and never talk uh, and never make decisions together about finances? That's not, it it makes no sense. I think it's a dangerous path because you're, you're not really, um, it can create anger and frustration and, and um, bitterness that are, is completely unnecessary because you you might be thinking something and the other person is clueless about it yeah, right. and you're all right. angry at them because they're doing this and that. And then you just keep pushing it down and pushing it under. And then something happens. You're like, rah, rah, and then the next thing you know, everyone's exploding. And, and then you realize this has been sitting there for years and it does damage to your marriage as opposed to just putting it all on the table and just saying, here, here's my debt. Here's your debt. This is how much we make. This is how we're going to have to live to pay the debt down. And then, then we can really start to save and move forward and, and, yeah, and build and the, a life. And the key to doing that, in my opinion, is to begin the conversation with where are we going? 
what, where are we going together? What is our dream? Mm -hmm. What is our goal? Mm -hmm. And a realistic it, goal. Well, yeah, but yeah. I mean, well, I mean, it could be it. What do you mean? And that goal can change. What does change. that mean? I'm what just saying, mean? like, you know, I want to, I want to have six Cadillacs in my garage. And, well, what if someone you know, does? Well, that's all right. That's all right, but you have to build towards it. <laughs> well, you know? I know, but I mean, what I'm saying is, like, let's say you wanted six Cadillacs in the garage, and I didn't. We don't have a common goal. There's nothing wrong with your goal. There's right. nothing wrong with my goal. Sure. I'm saying whatever, whatever the goal is, it just needs to match so that you're going to the same place. So if somebody, and this is what I hear all the time, um especially on the Ramsey thing with all the call-ins that people know I listen to it's you have somebody who's, who has a completely different vision for where they're going and what they value than the partner. And so they don't, they don't, if they're not coming together to even realize that they have different values, they're definitely not going to be able to work on their money together because they're not even going to the same place. Well, that could be part of the problem. That's what I'm trying to get at is that if I don't think you would necessarily, uh, want to be married to me if my if my values were i want to have a uh 15 million dollar home no and, that's because it doesn't match mine uh 14 but, boats in different places all over the country and uh, you wouldn't want that so i'm just saying that's why it's important to talk about it first of all and to be realistic about it i'm not saying that that's not realistic but all that comes with a whole separate thing of other sacrifices to get to that place yeah that's like another conversation that's a whole but, another conversation but uh, but my the point, point is, is that hopefully before you even said I do, you figured all those things out. And that's part of the problem, too. You really have to start with this stuff to some extent from the very beginning, if you can, to, to, to kind of understand you're both on the Where same you're level of yeah. goals. Yeah, for like sure. what you want. For sure. And then, but of course, it's not always going to be, it's, it, it's, it's not going to be resolved before you get married. The best you can do is to know and agree on what the values are. That's really what it comes no, down I to. Agree. Yeah. I agree. Because then all this stuff that comes up are really more logistics because you know, you I mean, if... and I think for us, that's been as hard as money has been for us to deal with just like any other couple over the years in different ways. We were always going to the same place. Yeah. That's never changed. Mm -hmm. And that's why the team at that coupled with the fact that there's no such thing as his and hers in our life. It doesn't, no. it's not a thing. So going to the same place and not thinking in terms of his and hers to me is the key. Yeah. It's the whole enchilada. Right. Right. And anybody can choose to do that. It's a mindset. Yeah. It doesn't matter whether you well, make $30,000 or $500,000. I mean, it's not about what's in the bank. It's about what the way you think. What, why'd you do well, that I'm just, with your face? No, I'm just making a face because I'm, I'm thinking to myself, the whole purpose of getting married is two people become one. It, that's what it is. You become one person. And the physical manifestation of that becoming one person is another human being that my wife has the wonderful gift, amazing gift of giving birth to a human being. I don't have that. I don't have that gift. Oh, I'm glad you said that. That's great. Cause that segues into the final thing that I wanted to make sure we talk about. And that is um, that the modern generation it, I, I, my, I argue that they're going about it all wrong with the his and hers mentality, mm -hmm. but another huge piece of the puzzle that they are not, they've had no grooming in whatsoever. And they come to learn it later and they can't figure out what the hell's going on is sex differences in marriage and how glaring those become after the kids come along. Because prior to that, men and women do feel very mm -hmm. quote unquote equal or similar because mm -hmm. they're living the same lives. They're going yep. to school, they're working, whatever. Yep. It's not until the kids come along typically, or even when you, even just being starting to think about having them, that all of a sudden these differences start to matter. So what a lot of the modern generation is dealing with is they think it doesn't matter who earns what. Yeah. And they think that started uh, when I was in college in the 80s. Yeah, but now it's fully stuff. in. And yeah. so they don't have any comprehension that why should it matter if she if, if she, she makes, makes 400,000 yeah. and he makes 50? Right. What, what's the problem? It, yeah, it, there's a big there's a big problem. problem. Yeah. And, and I know we're not doing a whole episode on the role reversal thing, yeah. we could do it, but I do want to just account for sex differences and explain why, while yes, shared finances I mean, are crucial, why yes, they're crucial, we don't want to um, but, say that it's as simple as just sharing finances because who earns what does matter. Well, it does. Well, here, here's and I want the, you to explain. Why. Well, I would just Thank in you. my mind. Wait, what did you say a second ago when I said that's a perfect segue? Do you remember? 
I was going to just. Uh, uh, you said something. Uh, I don't know. It doesn't matter because uh, okay. let's talk okay. about it this way. Okay. So, so, um, the thing is, is that I it makes me very sad to see how um, men are uh, just treated like they're idiots nowadays, and and you have all these young young men who are lost, and you know they 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 have nothing really to make themselves stand up and push because the, all these women, they, it's now it is a fact that more women are getting degrees than men. And a lot of women who have these six figure jobs are not really attracted to these guys who, you know, don't, who just don't have six figure jobs and are not highly educated. It, it makes things upside down, especially if you want to start having kids, because that's what happens. Women want to have the kids just like the man does. And, she doesn't want to have to be the one who's carrying the ball all the, all day. And so I was kind of talking to Suzanne about this the other day. It, it's kind of like men, that's the only thing men have. Women have this incredible power to give birth, to, to bring a human being, to create a human being within their body and then give birth to it. What do men have? I mean, the only thing that comes out of their body is farts or whatever. I mean, there's really nothing that men can offer other than to go out and and provide for for her and for the baby that's huge that makes men feel it gives them a a, a meaning in life the, the female meaning in life in 90 percent of the time is giving birth to a child and raising that child for the man it's i'm going to go out and conquer the world for my wife and my baby so that they have a safe place to grow and excel and you want that child to become this tremendous human being it's kind of like the way we have it now the way the way men and women are upside down it's like trying to 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 say okay you're a bird but you're gonna you're gonna be in the water now that your whole life is gonna be underwater and you're a fish and guess what you're gonna live on the land and walk around on the land it doesn't work they both die it, it just doesn't happen so you're asking for for something that is biologically framed in a way for a specific reason, and you're going against all of it. I'm not saying women should not get educated. I'm not saying women should not make an income. I'm saying that for a short time in life, the wife's main pull is to have the child and to raise the child in the house. And what's happening is that because they're not told that in advance, they're moving through the world and making decisions without that piece in it, thereby assuming that they're going to feel just the same after they have a baby and they're going to keep going with their work. Mm -hmm. And just th there's no problem. Just like fold no. that baby into the life that you've already no. created. And they're having problems in their marriages because of it, because they weren't planning ahead for that. Or they made financial decisions like buying a house based on two incomes instead of one, just to bring it back to the money thing. Yeah. There's all these life decisions that are being made as though, as though men and women are interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And it becomes glaringly obvious that they're not only after the kids come, which is why I want to conclude this whole thing by saying that it's so important that parents talk to their children about money and marriage as they're growing up. And I think that's one thing that um, is a big missing piece to this puzzle is that parents are not sharing enough about what we're talking about mm -hmm. with their kids when they're young so that they can make better life decisions, mm -hmm. both financially yep. and life decisions yep. and about who to marry and all of that. Yep. And so that's, that's getting, you know, into, I don't know. That's to me, when I think about money and I, I'm circling it back to how we were raised. If we had, how, how do you think things would have been different? Do you, if you had been raised, like I was raised, how do you think things would be different for us or um, you? Personally? I wouldn't have wasted as much time in my twenties trying to figure out what the hell I was going to do with myself. I really think that that's a big part of it. Um, I think that's why I think both of us are so much more dedicated to just being straight up with our kids about everything under the sun, because we knew because the world, if we didn't, if we weren't honest with them about our life philosophy and the impact that our life philosophy has on our lives and the people around us, like what we choose to do, Valuable. the world would choose for us. 
what it wants when the world is doing all this crazy stuff. And I was like, I'm not allowing these things to overtake my children. I'm going to show them how we've done it and how we've had a relatively sound, peaceful life in our 25 years. And that I want them to have all the tools as they get into adulthood and they're ready to go and they're armed to go. There's no, I just think about the wasted years. I wouldn't have found you if I hadn't done what I did, granted, but the wasted years that I took to try and figure out where I needed to be and where I was going. And that's largely because things were, I was influenced by the stuff that was around me rather than being told by your parents, you're going to get all this, how to do they're going right to do all this thing. Yeah. They're going to say this to you. Don't listen I to So them. you're saying like, if, cause you didn't have parents who counter who gave you the counter to what you heard. That's where you're missing. Cues. I well, did that, in some ways, goes, but in other ways I didn't. I mean, there were, you know, my, yeah. there were things about my mom and my dad that were great, but the money part was just non-existent. Well, that's what I'm, that's what I'm getting. Cause this is about that. This is about money. And I'm saying now that's making more sense. Just even as we're talking about it, when I asked you originally, why do you think you were more, you fell prey more to that cultural messaging where someone because else might have, yeah. it's because you didn't get anything right. opposite at home. Right. That's interesting. Right. Um, and that's why it's so. I had, I'll put it this way. I had prejudices because I listened to what the, 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 the people in power around me were saying to me about it and the messaging I was getting rather than making up my own mind and seeing that it's a two way street. Everything has a yin and a yang to it. And you have to balance that out, really. Or I mean, just life, that there's another way is. of looking exactly. at the world. Yeah, exactly. And then you and, make your own decision. Yeah, and if you're right, you're because using if your you, brain. And if you hadn't gotten it from your parents, you, that's why you've taught everything yourself. I mean, you were so self-made in so many ways, in your just everything. That's a whole other. I know, but I think thing, part but, of it, yeah. in fairness to my parents, they were also very deep thinkers, and they looked at every. You know, I would have conversations with both of them, and you pretty much looked at every corner of the room before you made a decision. And I think that was one thing that was very much a part of, of my upbringing. And that has, that has done well for me. So just to, just to conclude, I just, oh, I, I really want to emphasize this book again, because I really think it's the best place to start. And I send some of my coaching clients there almost every time, which is this Rachel Cruz book, know yourself, know your money. You will find out, if you, especially if you've never even thought to do this and you're having problems in your marriage with your money and it's not working out, start with that book and go back to your childhood and your messaging and where you got what you got, what it is that you want, getting on the same page with your husband or wife about your goals and where you're going. And then the rest is sort of logistics. And we're not going to get into all that today, you know, budgeting and all that. Um, but just, we're talking about what you grew up with, where you're going, getting on the same page with your spouse. There's certainly more to this conversation than this. Well, I'll, but I'll, that, I'll add one more thing. The, yeah. the key the thing about reading that book is that, um, now I haven't read it, but I think just from uh, the way Suzanne and I navigate our budget things every day, I think having that knowledge of what the other person brings to the table allows you to give them the space, but then they also, you understand yourself too. So there's more of a coming together. And that's what I mean by creating more intimacy between you, that you understand things about each other. And you both say like, you know, I got idiosyncrasies. I'll put it this way. And I now understand what my idiosyncrasies are. And because of that, I laugh at myself about how silly I am. Cause I picture myself as like a squirrel. Every time I have a nut, I'm going to bury it in the ground, 10 feet in the ground. And then Suzanne's like, what happened to that nut? I'm like, well, I buried it. And it's gone. <laughs> totally and then you're right. like, well, I want to eat it. <laughs> I mean, what, what'd you do that that's for? That's totally what happens. So hundred percent. That's, so that's the kind of stuff that you have to kind of, you know, understand those things where, you know, Oh my God. Oh my God. Yeah. Anyway. So anyway, that's, that's our story. Yours is going to be different. And the reason why we're doing this again is so that you feel less alone and you know, you can relate and feel lighter, I hope, and begin to turn things around if you're struggling in your marriage on the money front. And, um, we're, as I said, we're going to continue to do more of these episodes. Um, and I want 
I would love to hear from you, you know, re- reach out at Suzanne at the Suzanne Fanker show.com and let me know what you think of these particular episodes, especially with Bill on, because I need feedback to know if you like it or don't like it. Yeah. I want to know whether <laughs> I need to come on again. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So just, yeah. Keep, you know, keep those emails coming. I love reading them. And, um, and if you have a specific re- request, um, we will cover that as well. I know one that I want to do has to do with what you were saying about how you were lost in your 20s. There are a lot of men today. I like the average guy was like you mm-hmm. were sure. long before I met you in your 20s. Right. And parents are freaking out about their daughters mm-hmm. dating them. Mm-hmm. And that's a serious subject that sure. um, we need to cover. So we're going to do that on a, on okay. a different a different day for sure. Right. But I need you here for that. All right. It's okay. always a pleasure. I was glad to join you and it's always fun. So um, I hope we help people. Thanks, Bill. Talk right. to you next time. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And that ends this hour of the Suzanne Venker Show. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and to leave us a review as well as share this episode with a friend. As always, you may reach me with any questions or comments at Suzanne at the Suzanne Show.com. And if you would like to support this podcast, which would be very much appreciated, you can do so at patreon.com forward slash the Suzanne Banker Show. Thanks, everyone. Have a good week.